This is a talk on the subject of fierce grace. And I'm going to start with a few quotations from some Christian mystics. Julian of Norwich. By the workings of mercy and grace, we are made all fair and clean. Hildegard of Bingen. Don't let yourself forget that God's grace rewards not only those who never slip, but also those who bend and fall. Thomas a. Kempis, grace is given to us to train us and is removed to test us. Well, the idea of life somehow being graced has always been important to me. I've just written my memoirs and I decided to call them Amazing Grace because all my life I've been aware of a certain helping presence that has been with me, guiding and inspiring me and challenging me, and a lot of times seeming to dig me out of big messes. And my experience of grace is therefore that it seems to manifest as an empowering presence that can be consciously evoked, say by prayer and meditation, yet may also be present as an equally empowering force without being consciously called for. And in this talk, I want to look at a side of grace which not many people think about, and yet I see is very relevant to what's happening in the world today, its fierce side. And I first came across the idea of fierce grace when a teacher of mine, dear Ramdas, whom I greatly admired and respected, was suddenly felled by a stroke. He was at the height of his powers. He was teaching and speaking everywhere. He was enjoying his scuba diving. He was a successful lecturer and a spiritual guru, and being fated everywhere. Dear Ramdas, I went to many retreats with him absolutely wonderful, wonderful human being. And suddenly his busy and successful world fell apart because his, he had a stroke and the stroke was severe and it affected many parts of his body. And a film was made about Ram Dass's post-stroke life and he decided to call it Fierce Grace because he realized there was a profound teaching for him in what had happened, and that his so-called calamity in becoming disabled was at one level a blessing, because it made him not only aware of how much his ego self had relished in his being such a successful spiritual teacher, but it also May, it implied that he was less busy and so he had more time to be in silence and to go into his divine self. And dear Ram Das talked about being stroked by grace. And I remember him quoting a poem by Rumi. Be grateful for the friend's tyranny. And Rumi always... Um, refers to the friend as God or grace. Be grateful for the friend's tyranny, not his tenderness. So the arrogance in you can become a lover that weeps. 
And incidentally, the same thing happened to an, the eminent Hindu scholar and Christian mystic B. Griffiths, who also had a stroke and who also recognized its beneficial side. And he talked about how he felt that his heart and his tenderness was not fully awakened, but it somehow had the effect of activating this side of his nature that he felt that he'd been closed off to. And so he also felt it a great blessing in disguise. And in my own life, I've at times gone through periods of extreme crisis that have caused me great distress. But in retrospect, I realized that they were definite blessings as they allowed radical transformations to happen for me that couldn't have happened in any other way. In other words, I couldn't seem to let go of certain attachments to particular ways of acting and seeing the world unless they were ripped away from me, and they were. So crises were painful, but I saw Grace's light emerge out of their darkness. So while I hugely emphasize and value the importance of having as much joy as we can in our lives, joy is a sign of the presence of God, said the great Teilhard de Chardin. I think that when, that there's certain times there are certain transformations that can only happen through suffering and crises. And that when life chooses to deal us rough or fierce cards, and it seems to be doing so a lot at this time to a lot of people, I think we're called upon to accept them with grace. And to quote Rumi again, there is treasure in your heart. It is heavy with child. Welcome this pain. It opens the dark passage of grace. The spiritual teacher Gurdjieff believed in this as well, and often dealt with his students in an intentionally fierce way. And he said that given man's tendency to be unconscious, the only way he'll wake up is if he receives a shock greater than the sum of his inertia. Or a quotation from another spiritual teacher, the master Duaj Kul, man has a habit of crisis. They serve to test the purpose, purity, motive, and intent of the soul. Crises foster compassion and understanding. For the pain and inner conflict they engender is never forgotten especially they draw upon the resources of the heart. So I'm suggesting then that there's a strong connection between crises and the opening of our hearts, which I feel is the most important thing that needs to happen in terms of our human evolution. And if many of the shocks which a lot of us are experiencing at this time, if they don't destroy us. And yes, you know, sometimes shocks can. They have the capacity to help us evolve deeper dimensions of our humanity. And I ask myself this, great human beings like Gandhi, Martin Luther King, Vladimir Zelensky in Ukraine, could their heroic status have been born if it not for the great crises that were happening in their countries? So I am saying that grace is fear side has the capacity to stretch us into whole new domains of being. 
grace, fierce grace is a way that initiation takes place. And I'll quickly define initiation, which Marcia Eliad defined as a basic change in our existential condition where the novice emerges from his ordeal endowed with a totally different being from that which he possesses before his initiation. In my personal life at this moment, I'm going through a very interesting initiation in that I have a serious disease and dealing with the treatment for it is not particularly pleasant. However, I view this as a golden opportunity for me to evolve, to not slip into, oh, poor me, oh, poor old Serge is ill, oh dear, how helpless, blah, 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 which I could easily do. But rather, I see that it challenges me to redouble my, my, my meditative and my prayerful practices so I can feel inwardly abundant and full of life. And in all truth, I can say that I've made certain big shifts in these last few months in terms of the, the well-being of the spirit within me not despite, but because of my illness. And I realize there's a part of me, my spirit, that is completely untouched by what is happening physically for me. So in no way do I see this as an enemy come to disable me, but rather as a friend come to re-enable me, to support me, to work more mindfully to become who I truly am. So thank you, disease, because you're gracing me and you're giving me new life. And I'm being quite sincere. I'm not being kind of goody-goody, all spiritual, nice. This is absolutely the truth. And similarly, whenever I get to see some dark, unpleasant or manipulative side of me rising into consciousness and becoming visible. And I have to say, I view this quite often, my dark side, my shadow side, you know, some part of me I thought I'd moved beyond. I welcome this as a gift. I'm being given the opportunity to work with this dark side of mine, so I can start acting it out and projecting it out into the world. And Carl Jung, of course, um, understood this. And he said, if you want to evolve, don't go up into the light, don't go sit on the mountaintop, go down into the shadow, because he knew that that was where grace lay, and that if we venture deeply enough into our darkness and search enough there, that we'll find the light revealed in its heart. And I, again, I know this from my work with my clients in my psychotherapy practice and that if painful issues emerge and I can help them with what's happening and work with them, that at some point a breakthrough to a deeper level will take place. And it may happen quickly, it may take time. But the point is, that unless we become aware of the wounds and blockages lying in the subterranean realms of our beingness, we can't really evolve as human beings. And about 50 years ago, I was at Findhorn and I heard a lecture by David Spangler. This is what he said, and I think it applies even more today. Underneath the patterns of instability, this is what David said, in the world, a profound spirit of love and goodwill is at work and is using the instability and the individuals that emerge from it as the farmer uses a plow to turn the soil 
and prepare it for new seeds and new harvest. That's quite a statement, isn't it? It implies that Trump and Putin are potential instruments of grace. And I say, why not? I think they do us a favor as, you know, as together, they and, you know, quite a few others who are well known in the world embody pretty much everything that's most repellent and disgusting about being a human being. And they, and they help us to realize that if we're to have a, a better world, everything that smells them needs eliminating because they embody everything that a human being ought not to be or do. So let's look at instability. There's a hell of a lot of it around us. And at all levels, our world is being churned up, turned inside out and upside down. And it's breaking apart. The old dysfunctional society is beginning to implode. And we see this happening in different countries and it's happening in different ways. And in some parts of the planet, it's happening very ferociously. And while it's extremely painful and insecure sort of making, I think that from a broader perception that takes in the requirements of the well-being of humanity as a whole, Perhaps we can see this as an expression of grace. Why? Because our world doesn't work for too, for far too many of us. It's too painful for far too many people in the world. And so it needs to fall apart because our society needs to be rebuilt hopefully in a new, more inclusive way. Where the poor, the needs of the poor people are catered for, for example. And my sense is, and I've written a long article about it, you'll see it in my, um, it's the epilogue of my, of, of my last book, I believe that the going is going to be very tough over this century and for many of us, and that we'll no doubt see the collapse of many of those institutions and organizations which we felt were most secure. But I feel that this needs to occur for a whole new order of being to arise phoenix-like out of the ashes. And my intuition tells me to be positive. My intuition tells me that however unlikely it seems at this present time, that there's a truth in what Richard Buck wrote in his book, Cosmic Consciousness. I think he wrote it about 80 years ago when he said, cosmic consciousness will become more and more universal earlier in an individual's life until the race at large will possess this faculty. This new race is in the act of being born from us and in the new and in the near future, it will occupy and possess the earth. How about that? And I say that fierce grace is setting up the conditions for this. In fact, our world has changed a huge amount in the last quarter of a century. And one way is that so much of what used to be hidden has now in the open. Okay, we, we now live in a post-truth, conspiracy theory-ridden culture, I agree. But a lot of us are more aware of what's happening the evil around us is so much more out in the open. And while evil is always difficult to deal with, I've written a lot about it um, and given lectures on this topic. I believe that it being more in the open 
it allows us more opportunities to find new ways to deal with it. So that I think it's a positive thing that our inhumanity is coming more and more to the surface, that we read our, our daily newspapers, we, we turn on the news, and we see our rampant materiality, our lack of integrity and morality, our capacity to hate and to destroy, to be cruel and harm and torture. It's right in our faces as never before. In fact, fierceness is everywhere. The war in Ukraine, the tyranny going on in China, the rise of terrorism and right-wing nationalism, extremism and fascism, our disregard of global warming, poverty, huge poverty and addiction, millions of immigrants fleeing from their country because of war and, and, and crises caused by environmental disasters. And we see so many world leaders in positions of power hypnotized by the comforts of status, pleasure, and wealth. These people are only concerned with what suits them and their clan and what they can best do to hang on to power. I don't need to name any names. We all know who these people are. But I believe that underlying all this fierceness lies grace. It's, it's touching us at a deep level. In doing Elgin's words, he wrote a fantastic book called Choosing Earth that I really recommend. It's the immense suffering of millions, even billions of precious human beings, coupled with the destruction of many other life forms that will burn through our complacency and isolation. Suffering is the psychological and psychic fire that can awaken our compassion and fuse individuals, communities, and nations into a cohesive and consciously organized global civilization. The philosopher and religious professor, Chris Bash, believes the same thing. This is important. Chris suggests that we see the species mind as a unified psychic field. And he believes that this field will be driven into a very tumultuous state by the extreme suffering generated by a monumental global ecological crisis. And that in this hyper aroused state, the species mind will exhibit the capacity for rapidly accelerated change, heightened creativity, and higher self-organization. Crises have an incredible effect on speeding up our evolutionary mechanism. Half a century ago, my old mentor, the wonderful Sir George Trevelyan, wrote these prophetic words. Out of the confusion of a crumbling society will emerge individuals who are touched by higher guidance. They will inevitably flow together with others of like inspiration and a new quality of society will begin to form. This is the true adventure of our times. And I believe, dear Sir George, and if some of us seem to be adept in causing suffering, others of us, in fact, many millions of us, 
feel the need powerfully to alleviate it. And over the last few decades and increasing in numbers every year, exactly as George Trevelyan prophesied, unsung heroes are popping up in every country and in every area of enterprise with one aim to create a new world, a better world, a world that works, a humane world, a world that will allow for the birth of a higher consciousness. And I feel this very, 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 very strongly in my heart. I feel that the fierceness of what is happening all around us it seems, is inspiring the people who are the builders of this new world to exercise their different difference-making muscles with a zealousness they never knew existed. Now, if we're a kind of conventional sort of person, we're unaware of these activists for a transformed world, as most of our news channels tend mainly to emphasize the bad things going on. And if they do talk about activists, it tends to be only if that activist is a celebrity. But my dear friends, I tell you that if a lot of celebrities are activists, and that's terrific because they can end, because their being well known can help their cause. You know, I think of a great man like dear Elton John. A lot of them are completely unknown. In fact, most of them are completely unknown. I have another quotation for you by Bill McKibben. He says, the movers and shakers on our planet aren't the billionaires, the politicians, and the generals. They're the incredible people around the world filled with love for thy neighbor and for the earth who are resisting, remaking, restoring, renewing, rewiring, and revitalizing. Greta Thunberg and Malala, that brave woman who was shot in the head by the Taliban. They're the ones that we know on the surface. They're the celebrity activists. But there's many incredible people where fierce graces at work awakening their hearts and inspiring their creativity. And I say this because I've been terribly privileged in having sort of written two books about this, to have been privileged to have met these young people and to have been inspired by their vision and to realize how uncluttered they are with so many of the clutterances that impeded old codgers like me who grew up in the 60s. So that's why I have a lot of hope for these young people, because they're brave souls, they're wise souls. And, and they don't think, and they don't envision their lives about rising on any corporate ad, um, <laughs> ladder and making a lot of money, but being about being committed to take stands for a transformed world. So I'm saying that at the same time as the old world is falling apart, these brave visionaries are quietly beginning to put in place the foundation stones for a new one. In my book, my last book, um, Amazing Grace, I made 24 predictions of what our new society will one day look like. I'll just finish off this by just quoting a few of them. I say that a new model of what it means to be human will emerge, whereby we're no longer moved to deify the rich, the notorious and the celebrity. Instead, we'll come to see that the real great and the good are those who live unselfishly, 
humbly, wisely, simply, and unpretentiously, and a new aristocracy of soul composed of men and women consider recognizing the importance of working on their own evolution and initiating projects designed to benefit as opposed to destroy society will start emerging. I say that those who are most resistant and hostile to change will be given opportunities to learn to see the world in a new light and the damage they do by opposing the natural flow of evolutionary advancement. I think that's so important. And, and as this will happen, people will increasingly come to realize that they're stewards, not despoilers of the planet, and that their role is to help Earth's delicate ecosystems recover. In a similar way, I believe in the future that we'll have a new kind of politician who will be more authentic and honest and who refuse to be bought. And gradually, all forms of government based on repression will vanish from the face of the earth at the same time as all violence and oppression to minority groups comes to an end. I say that a new value system is going to be born, whereby honesty triumphs over corruption, kindness over indifference, and generosity over greed. My friend, I believe the years ahead of us will be fierce and challenging. We need to live as mindfully and as heartfully and with as much consciousness and integrity as possible. But I believe that the, that the heart of humanity is going to open more and more and that grace's abundant and loving arms is going to extend to enfold us all. So that's my positive message. <laughs>